so welcome. I, I am so delighted to be here. Um, thank you, Kat, to moderate a discussion which is both with and about man ambassadors. And I actually just asked Kat on the way up, did you make up that word? And she said, actually, Harvard did, but we've stolen it and we're using it very, very well. So the next 45 minutes or so will be a conversation with four men and one, one woman who are not just very high on the gender intellect scale, but who are actually using that gender intellect to bring about great change in our industry, and I want to suggest beyond our industry. So we're going to hear from them um, today about what's working, what's not, what we should all leave here uh, thinking about doing, and what actions they've taken and what actions they want to take to continue what this conference is all about, the advancement of women in leadership, and particularly women in creative leadership. So let me start by introducing this incredibly esteemed group of people I have sitting to the left of me. And I'll begin with Courtney Buchert. Courtney is an advertising agency veteran. He is currently the CEO of an agency called Eleven Inc. in San Francisco. He told me he is not just a second generation San Franciscan, but a second generation San Franciscan ad person. I won't say ad man. He's worked in small agencies and big agencies. He actually ran uh, the McCann San Francisco office when they had Microsoft, which was a huge global account, as he said to me, in a, a place he loved to work. And he left somewhere in the neighborhood of eight or nine years ago to go run 11 to get closer to the work. I found out two really interesting things about Courtney in my research on him. The first one, Cat made easy, it's that he was the first uh, CEO of an agency to sign up to sponsor the 3% conference in 2012. So round, round of applause for that. And I also found out that he was a zoology major in college, so that might have something to do with it. I'm also delighted to welcome my friend, Michael Roth, who is the chairman and CEO of IPG, a little company that some of you might have heard of. Um, Michael has been in what has been described as a very long turnaround of IPG and one that has certainly proved to be extremely fruitful if you listen to their last earnings call. He famously says he is, uh, he is not an ad man, so he came to advertising first as a, a member of the board of directors of IPG in the early 2000s and then was asked to step in and run the place and that has gone very, very well. And what I'll say about Michael is he is a man who um, walks the talk. So Michael hosts every year, IPG hosts every year, what I think is the best event in Cannes. I think it's going in its sixth year this year, and it gathers essentially all of the women leaders in Cannes and many men to talk about what we can do there in Cannes to advance the issue of more women in creative leadership. So welcome, Michael. I'm also very excited to have Max Rutherford join the conversation. Max is in charge of something called su Supplier Diversity for GSD&M in Austin. He's had that role for about seven years. He came out of packaged goods in Mars before he did that. And I, I was chatting with Kat before about what that really means and what Max brings to the panel in terms of dimension. Max is actually in charge of how his agency goes to market as a buyer. So making sure that we have sufficient uh, gender and diver uh, diversity, race, inclusion in who we do business with, which is, I think, a very important part of the creative conversation. And in doing my, my so well done, Max. In, in doing my research on Max, what I learned is that he is a man of extraordinary action. Apparently, at the 3% conference, which he helped bring to Austin, there was a moment in a day of pouring down rain where Kat found she couldn't actually advance her slides just before the conference, and Max was the person who ran out as the supplier himself and got her a new slide advancer. So well, well done for that. Um, I'm also thrilled to welcome Bruce Henderson to the conversation. Uh, Bruce is officially, I think, the only person on the panel who is both an author uh, one and a half times, once of a book he wrote called um, 
Waiting. Yes. And the other, um, as a co author, a contributor to another book. And he is also a rock star. So before coming into advertising, Max had a long and fruitful career as a singer and songwriter. He's most recently had a long career with WPP. He um, was a creative director at Ogilvy, working on campaigns like Six Flags, but most recently has been the head of Geometry Global for the last two years and was poached from there to go run, I think starting in January, Jack Morton as the new creative director. So wow. welcome, Bruce. We're so happy to have you here. <laughs> and last, but most certainly not least, is my dear friend and partner in many things, the very well-known Shelley Zalis, who is the chairman and founder of TFQ Ventures, which stands for the female quotient. She is also probably even better known as the founder and mother and maybe den mother of the Girls' Lounge, which is simply the very best gathering place and space, both intellectual space and physical space for women at every conference that many of us go to. Shelley left the corporate world in 2000 to strike out on her own. She was the founder of a company called OTX, which is in the research space, specializing in online research. And she was the first woman to make it on to the Research 25, uh, top 25 companies as CEO. And I think more importantly, she describes herself as the chief troublemaker, which for many of us has meant that she gathers women leaders together to say, what can we as a collective fighting force do to improve 3% to a much higher percentage in advertising? So welcome to all of you. Courtney, I want to start one more round of applause for this great group. I, I want to start, um, I want to start with a, a question for you. You um, and your agency, Eleven, were prominently featured in a Fortune article, uh, I think just last year, called No More Mad Men, which was essentially about your recognition of the need to really change the ratio inside your own firm. Um, I think I read that at the time you looked around and saw all male partners, all male creative directors, and a creative team that was, that was predominantly male. At the same time, your cat's first partner, as I said, at 3%. So give us some flavor as to why and what was behind all those things you told Fortune. Well, it was, a, um, uh, it was an interesting moment at an industry event when Kat uh, and I sort of were hiding in the corner since we're both um, generally introverts. And she was talking about the, the statistic and the thought for the 3% conference, uh, which hadn't completely formed yet. And I was nodding my head working at an agency where I, 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 I think my partners and I felt we were a very progressive and very thoughtful, gentle group of people. Um, and the more she talked about um, the statistics and the dissonance, I realized that we were as dissonant and maybe even more dissonant than, um, than the numbers she was offering. And it's kind of a gut punch when, you, when your perception of yourself and your own values and your sort of moral compass are really, you know, sort of brought to your face that they're at, it's at odds with how you're actually acting. Um, and you know, in in film, there's that moment, that moment of realization where the director like zooms in on your wide eyes, and suddenly, you know, images start cascading quickly across, and you know, cut to the creative department, cut to the boardroom, cut to the meeting, cut to this, cut to that. <laughs> and for me, the the last image of that montage was of my daughter, who is. Um, planning on heading into this industry and realizing that here I was leading an agency, um, encouraging her to move forward, only to wonder what kind of industry that I'm encouraging her to jump into. And that I was signed up probably before we finished our cocktail. So, so dissonance as sort of presented through the lens of thinking about where your daughter was going to go. Michael, you, um, you've been um, quite outspoken in a very good way on these issues. So you've kind of ran straight into the dissonance. One of the things that you have said very publicly is that you've tied diversity and inclusion to performance reviews and to even compensation amongst your leaders at IPG. So tell us about that and tell us how it's going. <laughs> well, it's going pretty well, actually. <laughs> um, well, first of all, you know, I was an outsider, although I can't say I'm not an ad man anymore. So I guess uh, 
Um, but when I first came to this industry, my first meeting uh, with the leaders in our company were, was filled with white males. And, and uh, I was actually shocked about it. And I said, how can we be advertising and communication when we don't represent the marketplace or the universe? And I said, this is ridiculous. So we embarked on uh, diversity and inclusion as being part of the core of IPG. And when I used to ask our agencies, what are you doing about diversity and inclusion? Their answer was, well, we belong to this organization. We, we belong to that organization. And I said, yeah, I asked you what you were doing about it, not what organizations you belong to. And the answer was nothing. So I'm a realist, and, and I like to get things done. So I figured the only way to get people to pay attention was to hit them where they pay attention to, and that's their pocketbook. So we put diversity and inclusion goals in their incentive compensation, which was a big deal at the time. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Right on. And, and the pushback was amazing, uh, but it didn't last very long because I had the pencil and the eraser, so uh, <laughs> they, they couldn't push back that much. But it really caused everyone to pay attention to a very significant issue, and frankly, my goal wasn't, I, I wasn't doing it because I was a, a nice guy. I was doing it to, to make our company more responsive to the marketplace. And frankly, it's worked. And, and we have a long way to go, but I think our company uh, is viewed in the marketplace. I hope it is. Uh, by the way, this group, I love being here. This is a recruiting opportunity. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, we, look, we just re announced results. I'll be uh, a little uh, obnoxious here, but we outperformed uh, all of our peer companies uh, on organic growth throughout the world. And if you're going to ask me, is there a direct correlation to that, I would tell you it certainly has a part of it uh, because our advertising business, all of our businesses are, are outperforming. And it's because we've, uh, I believe, uh, embraced diversity and inclusion. We've had. Uh, we, we've had, you know, since this is a, this is a female conference, I'll talk about 54% of our executives and non-executives non and managers are female. Uh, and, you know, I don't think it's by accident that we're performing. But I do believe that uh, recognizing diversity and inclusion is a competitive advantage. Uh, and when we recruit new people, I, actually, by the way, Bruce is new to IPG, so... Uh, <laughs> I'll ask him whether it had anything to do with it. You better answer it correctly, Ruth. Uh, um, but I do believe it's a competitive advantage, and, and it moves the needle, and, and that's what we're supposed to do. So I'm, I'm a believer. And, and by the way, I'll probably start including uh, Manbassador in my CV. You know? <laughs> so uh, I, I, it's, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. Michael, I'm just, I want to press on one, um, one thing you said, which is that, in fact, you would say your recent um, very strong quarterly results mm. do have some direct tie, um, whether or not you can make it, to what you've done to, to making this issue so prominent for your leaders. How do you think about the metrics there? Are you asking people to, say, a certain percentage of the workforce be women or... <clears throat> Racial minorities, what, how does that work? Now, some, one of my big competitors, one of the CEOs, claimed that I don't believe in, in quotas. And I said, I don't believe in quotas either, but I believe in performance. Uh, and and uh, I was just at a pitch, a big one, uh, just this week, actually. And I just was sitting back, and, and over 50% of the presenters were female. And I actually sat back and said, my goodness, maybe this is really working, OK? <laughs> Um, and, and so it's not a quota, it's basically, it's business. And, and how can you compete and, and represent your clients if you don't represent your clients? And when I meet with clients, a lot of them are females, people of color, and, and if we don't have people who represent our clients and the consumers, we can't perform, we can't understand the communication part of this. So there's no question that including it in our, what we, where we include it is in our uh, talent review. Every one of our agencies goes through a, a serious talent review with me and other members of the senior team, obviously including Heida Gardner, who runs our diversity and inclusion. 
And we ask them what they've done in terms of diversity inclusion. Every, every quarterly review I have with our, our business is, includes a section on diversity and inclusion. And I do it because I want to make sure that we're being responsive. And so if you want, I don't call it a quota, uh, I just call it as CEOs of our businesses paying attention to the marketplace. Um, you know, we are actually on females, we're ex in excess of the EEOC uh, uh, percentages that are required. So that's one indication. And we benchmark ourselves against, frankly, we can't benchmark against the industry because it's too easy uh, for us to, to outperform. So we, out, we, out, we benchmark against our clients. Uh, and to see where we are, because it, we still have a long way to go, but uh, you have to have benchmarks, uh, and our CEOs and business people have to perform. So I want to, I'm, I'm going to stay on IPG for a minute. I'll happily go to Bruce um, <laughs> on that. Max, I'm going to come back to you, but Sorry. Bruce, <laughs> Bruce had the um, dubious honor of being featured in the Valentine's Day 3% conference, Guys We Love video, this past year. <laughs> And he was featured there because he said, I hire great people, period. It turns out that 50% of them are women. So what, staying on Michael's theme, what I want to ask you, Bruce, is why is it so easy for you, but it looks so hard everywhere else in the industry? It's why Kat has gathered us all here to hire and retain and train and create ascension for great women. Well, retention's a different topic, I think, and we can probably discuss that later. Our industry, like all industries, faces challenges there. I think, <clears throat> I think it's partially what people are looking for. I do think the previous panelists talked about like hiring like, and I don't think that's wrong. I think that's true. Um, you know, my question is, why would you leave 50% of the talent on the table? when uh, I've certainly never had problems, but I think it has to do with what people are looking for in senior leaders. Our industry is quite interesting because in creative in particular, the people who get the big jobs are people who've won a lot at can, which is not to uh, say anything about can. I think it's very important, but I think some people overweight awards because the qualities and skills that make you an award-winning creative are not the same qualities and skills that make you a great leader and a manager. Um, great. <laughs> The, the greatest creative leaders have all of those capabilities, but they don't always come in the same person. So I think partially it's a question of when you're looking at who you're hiring to run accounts, you know, we talk very often about casting and so forth. When you're looking at running accounts or running departments, you need to look more holistically. And as I look holistically, if you're asking me, I recently left Geometry Global and Geometry Global had primarily a shopper footing in the US. If you're asking me who is best positioned to uh, win client business, run that client business, hire well, groom people, um, you know, you're going to get a good mix across the gender spectrum. In shopper marketing, for instance, I, I think it was in many respects a competitive advantage to have women because women do make 85% of all purchase decisions yeah. to begin with. But uh, and it's changing. We have more, uh, several of the female ECDs at Geometry had stay-at-home husbands um, necessary to, to accommodate the lifestyle that comes with this work. But it is a competitive advantage to have, I felt, in shopper marketing to have a woman creative lead ECD standing in front of a client saying, when I'm rushed after work and I'm shopping for my kids, I think about this yeah. and, and looking at it from both perspectives. So I think it has to do with looking at the holistic opportunity. Um, but I do tend to think away, awards are overweighted at looking at, uh, at uh, and I'm a little nervous talking about this because Michael's. Because <laughs> <laughs> your new boat, so you purposely put Max in between you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If necessary. You just, you just said something really important that I actually want to ask if anybody wants to um, comment on, which is the notion of to accommodate the lifestyle that goes with this work. Mm -hmm. To what degree is that the gating issue? Is that why we need CAT, we need CAT's conference? How much of that is the issue and, and what are we doing about that if it's the issue? No, I wouldn't mind speaking to it. it Please. The, the, one of the things, um, that the sort of journey and soul searching as a, as a 
agency leader is what are the root causes and what are the things that we can materially affect without harming our business in the short term. And the, the conclusion that we've come to is that you actually have to create space for um, talent to rise. And that's one thing for, a, you know, as a relatively small agency, the roles don't move that often. And so you actually have to purposely and consciously sort of rip your organization open to create space for new people to move through. But time is the other one. And that's about creating time to accommodate um, talent to, to move. And that is, you know, move through life phases, move through, you know, they're the hot hand and then they're having a period in their career where it's just not coming for them, but you know that the talent is in there. The nurturing of talent requires the creation of time and space. And time is one of the hardest ones. Michael. Yeah, well, look, I mean, this business, we all know, it, 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 it takes 120%. And you have to make the uh, work-life environment supportive of, of, of all types of responsibilities that our people have. And if we don't do that, uh, we're going to be at the short end of the recruiting side of the business. I forgot to mention, 40% of my board of directors are females. That's which, amazing. Uh, that is amazing. And, that, and by the way, that's not by accident. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's also, I mean, we're one of, uh, I think, 11 companies in the S&P 500 that have that kind of representation. Yeah. So that just permeates throughout the organization. And, and uh, I think the work-life part balance uh, is a critical component of making sure you're getting the best talent. So, so Max, I, I love what Courtney just said about you have to kind of rip up your organization to create space um, for, for this to actually go well, for, for more diversity and inclusion to happen. Your whole world at gsd &M is about making the creative supply chain and other parts of the supply chain more diverse. So just give everyone a little bit of a flavor of what you do. As I was researching it, I, I was pretty intrigued with how much impact you can have um, on, on as um, leading this process for the agency world, one. And two, is there specifically an issue in the creative profession, going back to what Bruce suggested about lots of creatives or people who want to win awards, is there something about there just being an insufficient number of women leading there? So you want darts to be thrown at me, right? I want what? You want darts to be thrown at me. Exactly. Right? Be, be provocative. That's what we're here for. So when you, when you look at the supplier side, one of the things that I do, I'm responsible for making sure that minority and women-owned companies have fair and equal opportunity to be involved with the work we do for our clients. And that presents a challenge because, as we know, the advertising industry is relationship-based. And being relationship-based, most are white males, and very few females are involved in that. So my job uh, from my agency and our clients is to make sure that opportunity is being given. So the way we do that is I did something several years ago when I came into the advertising industry because I came for food and beverage, and I realized that the advertising industry did not have process, procedures, goals, and things of that nature. And I had to figure out how in the world am I going to get them convinced that we need to set goals and we need to set measurements to have inclusion on the supplier <coughs> side. So one of the things my CNO sit in and talked about, and we talked about converting our creative groups into business groups. And mm. for each of those business groups, you have clients that make up those business groups. We made a decision that we would have goals set for each of those clients, regardless of whether those clients have goals or not. We set goals internally for us to meet certified minority women own inclusion. And in doing so, it forces us to look at those talented minority women owned companies and what they can do as far as bringing ideas to the table so that we can make you know, the diversity and the multiculturalism that our society has. So if you look at what Courtney has mentioned earlier about space, so one of the things that is a challenge is that getting those businesses involved in that work is an issue because, again, if I have someone or a creative has someone or a producer has someone that they're already committed to, they like, they have no issues with, why do I need to bring anybody else in? What is missing is that you don't have that other aspect of diversity that needs to be included. So we look for ways to try and find small projects to get those companies involved so they can prove themselves 
and be part of that talent. And that's how we hope to achieve that. So sort of let a thousand flowers bloom. It's not all going to be kind of one big sweeping initiative from the top, as Michael's done, right. but you've also, you have to have it coming up the other way. So really, really interesting. I want to shift now a little bit in the conversation to how you all serve as role models for everybody else who's out there, where they're, where that's working, where there's not enough. And Shelly, I want to go to you here. You have coined, I think you coined a term, if not, you've used it more than anyone else, called feminism, um, which really matters in this conversation. So talk about what you mean by that and the role that it plays. Yeah, you know, I think we're about to launch a new spelling of the word feminism, which will include the word men. So fe-men-ism, F-E-M-E-N-I-S-M, where we say modern feminism must include men. So I say Gloria Steinem, feminism 1.0, she for she. It's all about supporting one another. We have to lift one another up. If not helping each other, who will? Number one. Number two, feminism 2.0, United Nations, Emma Watson, he for she which is fantastic men supporting women, but we're about to come out with feminism 3.0, we for we. We have to do this together for transformation to happen. And I think when you think about it, you know, we all are empowering one another, gaining confidence, creating a voice. For me, diversity is not about gender. It is not about race. It is not about age. Diversity is about mindset and skill set. If you bring a diverse group of thinking together, you will end up with a diverse group of people naturally. And gender equality is not a female issue. We did not create this problem. It is a social and economic issue. And so when we talk about quota and we talk about unconscious bias, instead of talking about, yes, we need to start with a quota to ensure representation, but at the end of the day, men and women, we're all important, we're all equal, we're just different. We bring different strengths to the table. We make the table better. Men in general are more linear, more strategic, more decisive. But women have amazing characteristics too. We're more collaborative, we're more team building, we're more visionary. You need the combination to be successful in business. And so when we talk about you know, gender equality, I think it is really important to go way beyond 3%, but we need to look at the business outcome. And there's a lot of articles written today about the success that we're all, you know, ensuring by having women, African American, Hispanic, young, old, white, yellow, red. It doesn't, we're all people with amazing, amazing skill sets. So if you combine that all, we will be much more successful in business ultimately. And so that's where we hope to be going with feminism that, you know, gender equality has three buckets really. Wage gap, you know, why are men paid a dollar and women 77 cents on the dollar? So I started sensationalizing it. I started selling coconut water at Ad Week, a dollar to men and 77 cents to women. <laughs> like, fuck that. Like, it's just ridiculous, you know? It's like, that's if great. that's the case, then we should be paying 77 cents of all of our goods. I mean, I'd love to buy something for 77 cents since the, you know, and the guys for a dollar. I mean, let's just sensationalize the problem because it's so silly. Is it because, you know, we're less qualified? Are we less educated? Are we opting into lower level positions? Is it unconscious bias? Is it flexibility of culture? Is it just legacy? Like, what are the dimensions of the wage gap? And then, of course, culture of care. How do we create cultures that will get the best talent and not the available talent? And then how do we eliminate the unconscious bias? Instead of hiring by gender, let's hire by strengths. And maybe that will help us you know, not you know, be colorblind. Okay. And, and Shelly, just for the group, do a minute on unconscious bias, what it means and how it presents. Yeah, so here's just a simple girl's way of presenting unconscious bias. Guy, girl, Harvard, Harvard, 4.0, 4.0, Phi Beta Kappa, Phi Beta Kappa, you look exactly the same. What typically happens is they'll opt in for the guy because they'll say, oh, the woman one day is going to have a family and she's going to have a lot of responsibility. She's not going to be able to travel so much. She's not going to be able to work as late. So let's opt in and choose the guy. Better choice. 
But what if you said, I'm looking for a senior vice president to run a big team of 250 people, and what I'm looking for is someone that's more collaborative, someone that's better at managing a team, someone that can really multitask on steroids, someone that is a nurturer, someone that has empathy, and someone that is, you know, um, uh, m more involved in sort of the whole team environment and brings food to every meeting with flowers. <laughs> <laughs> Think about who would you then pick if you went by strength? Or if you said, I'm looking for an SVP that's more linear, mathematical, scientific, strategic. By the way, it might be a woman. I'm not saying that women don't have those strengths. But if we started recruiting by that, we could eliminate a lot of the what you look like or what you are versus who you are. It's more going in that. So let me go to Bruce on this. Bruce, so again, you, you ran a team at Geometry Global that was, I think half of the people on your team were women, a creative team to be specific. Did you consciously deal with the issue of unconscious bias or were there other things that you did to sort of get, um, get your team to a much better place on this issue? Well, uh, recruiting's tough because especially when you're looking at, I've always tried to look at portfolios without looking at names, and this is just one trick I have, without looking at names. I don't want to know the gender of the person, I only want to see the work. Um, and we tend to judge on that. You know, we, I think it, it, I start from a position that everyone wants to, most people are basically good and want to do the right thing. That's why I think unconscious bias is an interesting topic. Because there's all kinds of bias in the workplace. You know, men with children get paid more than men without children, for instance, on average. Um, there's tons of unconscious bias. But I think in terms of creative work, and it changes as you move up and you're looking for leadership, you are looking for those qualities if you're hiring properly. And there's also the available talent pool and who you can, who you can poach. Um, but I do think it's important to hire for the job and not necessarily. I also believe, and this isn't uh, necessarily common, I tend to hire for potential rather than what someone's done. I'm very interested in what they've done. It's indicative of what they can do, but I truly believe most people are capable of what they've done so far. Um, that used to bother me when I was at Ogilvy. Um, for a while, the creative pool was pooled. And there were certain people when you would, uh, when I put people up, I had a digital team and then I had a digital and direct team and then I worked on uh, integrated accounts. There were certain people when a pitch was being run, I would offer up to people who may have done a tremendous amount of direct work and, and the person who is trying to rally people for a pitch would say, no, they're direct people. And say, no, they're creative people. You know, bring them in, see what they can do, judge them on their, their abilities. So. I think it's case by case. I'm not sure that you can, you know, consciously, other than to say, uh, to look at two candidates who are exactly the same, which is, you know, statistically improbable, and consciously pick one. But unconscious bias does happen. You know, it's interesting though, I just came from the armed services, so we were helping the women in the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Marines, and their biggest problem is less than 15% of women in the military. And we were sitting around, there were a thousand women in the room and there were 10 guys and it's sort of back to what Michael was talking about and this senior ranking general from the Air Force gets up, she was this beautiful woman wearing this pantsuit that she rocked even though she said they were made by men for men and it was a little difficult getting in and out of it during combat, <laughs> she was a shooter. And she looked around the room and she said to the guys, 10%, she said, how does it feel being in this room today? A little uncomfortable, doesn't it? And she said, that's how we feel in the military every single day. And so part of the challenge, too, is when you have this unequal balance, this gender inequality, no one is performing at their best because they're just not as comfortable. And I was getting on stage with Barry Salzberg from Deloitte you know, recently, and I wrote a speech called Bring Emotion to the Boardroom and the Power of Emotion. And everyone always told me there's no room for emotion. And I said, of course there is. We need to bring emotion to the boardroom. He said, you know, Shelly, we just hired our first female CEO for Deloitte USA. And I said, why? To fill a quota or to make the table better? And he said, as a matter of fact, we used to have three out of 34 board members were women, and they never spoke at the board meeting because they felt uncomfortable. 
He said, I said, so what'd you do? He said, I kicked off five guys, I added four more girls, eight out of 34, and all of a sudden the dynamics changed. The women started talking more, they were more expressive, we stopped talking just about numbers, we started dimensionalizing the problem, and having real conversation instead of just you know, talking about the facts. And I thought that was really fascinating, that it's not just about raising the quota a little bit, but making it up an environment where everyone feels comfortable to bring you know, the best voices and the most expression to the boardroom as well. And I think you have to draw that out in certain, certain circumstances, whether it's a gender uh, discrepancy in terms of how we approach things. I mean, when I run meetings, I specifically ask everyone what their opinion is because some people are less comfortable. And sometimes, often as not, and separate gender from it, the quietest person will very often have the most interesting thing to say. Yeah, well, well said. And I actually want to come back to Courtney on this because he announced at the beginning of the panel that he was an introvert, as was Kat, which I did not <laughs> believe. Um, so we'll, we'll take that up later. Um, but to, to the notion of drawing people out and trying to make people feel comfortable, um, you were featured in this awesome article in Fast Company. Um, do you know what I'm going to say about um, people who learned some of their best things from their oh mother from their mothers? Yeah. So I guess what what I would ask you, I want you to tell people what you learned from your mother because I think it's really striking. And you're in a room full of women, many of whom, we all have mothers, many of us are mothers. What is it that we should be doing so that this, this kind of culture of making a comfortable space starts from the beginning? Sure. Um, quick context for it. My, my father was a, an art director, so he was a creative person. My mother was a chemist and ultimately a teacher. Um, and in many ways, given my zoology background, I, I must be veering towards my mother anyway. Um, <laughs> But she taught me to focus on, um, on listening and what other people hear. And it, it's interesting how it changes the dy dynamic that you can create in an environment when it's not about the list of things that you need to say, the authority with which you say it, the, cl you know, the clarity of command and control, but on understanding um, sort of the, the empathetic context that you're speaking into and having everybody, you know, where do we need to get to, where, what do you need to here in order to get where you need to go. And it just, it, it just switches the, the conversation around fairly dramatically. Beautifully said and sort of brings us, us back to where Michael started on kind of what he found when he came in as, as CEO of IPG. I wanna shift now and ask everybody in the audience to look at your programs, look at the second to the last page of your program and you're gonna find something there if you haven't seen it already called Manbassador Bingo. Um, awesome. Shelly, you're going to have to come up with feminism bingo after this. We play together. I go where Kat um, goes. Manbassador Bingo. This is a, a brilliant invention by Kat and team derived from um, a bingo game that was made about inclusion in the tech world. They started this, um, the idea that there could be micro actions that we get super conscious of whether or not um, we as leaders are taking them and that we're aware of what those micro actions can be. They started this um, at one of the conferences this summer um, to, to great fanfare and much appreciation. And what I want to ask um, our man ambassadors on this panel to do is to each talk, and Shelly, I'm going to ask you too, but I'm going to ask you in a slightly different way, to each talk about two things. One, and everybody's looking now at the micro actions. One, what is a microaction that you feel like you are sort of proudly leaning into, taking, getting, getting your domain to take? Um, and then we'll come back around. I want to hear those first. We'll come back around and ask you all to talk about the ones that you don't feel like you're sufficiently taking yet. And Bruce, I want to. I want to. You had the um, one of the last interesting words in that last conversation. So why don't I start with you? Well, I really, I want to start by saying I think the micro actions are a great idea because to Michael's point earlier and his talking about coming to the agency world and saying, what are you doing? It pains me to say this as a writer, I'm a writer by vocation, but words are really cheap. Action is all that counts. What yeah. have you done, not what have you said? We say a lot of things in this business to make ourselves feel good. 
but what are the actual actions? It's an interesting list, and I like the list because I think a lot of people, again, want to do the right thing, but are not sure how to start or what to do. Um, if I remember correctly, as I sent you my materials, I think I was pretty good and have been relatively good at being a sponsor, at advocating for women department, at, at trying to hire uh, well and fairly, and as I said, about half of those uh, people I've hired have turned out to be women. What I haven't done a great job of is on the accounting side, and I think one of the things people may be surprised about is, you know, I, I never really knew what this job entailed till I got there. I also didn't know what you actually can control and what you can't control. Um, for instance, you can't unilaterally in a public company go in and equalize all salaries. It's not possible. So even with the best intentions. So I feel that's a personal a failure. I don't know if it's a personal failure, but certainly something we looked at and tried to get to. And I worked with my creative services people and the CDs and the ECDs. And towards the end of my tenure, certainly at my last agency, we were very close to gender parity on pay. And in fact, uh, they'll be dismayed to hear this, but at the senior levels, I think most of the women were making a bit more than the men. Um, well so, done, well so, done. But again, the micro actions are a great idea, and I think the bingo card, and, and looking at these things as men and, and people who work in agencies, what can we do every day to make the place a little bit better? Because I think everyone in an agency has the opportunity to make the place better. You just have to make a decision. Well said, and Max, arguably, you're doing micro actions all day, every day in your day job. What, what's one that you feel most proud of and one that you feel like you still need to work on? First, let me just say, I, I thought the, uh, the card was a, a great roadmap on actions. And one of the challenges that I find is that getting people out of their comfort zones. This document, this little roadmap can be that exact thing that can get people out of their comfort zones and allow them to start talking about diversity and inclusion without feeling intimidated or feeling that it's a taboo or that it's guarded. So when you look at those micro actions, I think if we were to do that on a consistent basis from a decision-making point of view, I think you will see change. Going back to what Michael was saying earlier is that he had that pin, right? He can say yes or no. I think when we look at those micro actions, we can do that very same thing. It's about action, but it's execution and follow through. So with our agency, I think, Joanna, we do a very good job of getting folks involved from, from a media standpoint, from the interactive standpoint, from Twitter, all of those mechanisms to communicate and get you engaged. So I think the engagement is there, right? Where we're falling short really is on getting the sponsorship or, or the sharing piece, getting women businesses and their work presented for award or presented for greatness. So we're not doing a very good job of that. And a lot of that is because, again, if you look at the decision-making table, you don't find minorities or women on that decision side. So it's gonna be very difficult to get that presented. So we have, we have to change that piece of it. Yeah, it's almost like you've got to go from right. the top down and the bottom up, and we're not yet meeting in the middle there. Michael, you probably have the most people working for you of anybody on this, on this stage. I think so. <laughs> uh, this planet. Um, I, my micro actions become macro ac actions as soon as it happens. So uh, yeah, the, fir the, the obvious one was holding uh, everyone accountable for diversity and yeah. inclusion. So that was... Uh, the one I picked in terms of the micro action. The one that I found most interesting, <laughs> this is, I'll give you a real time experience about it, uh, was this issue of vacation and time. Ooh. And this is one of those things where I say, uh, do as I uh, say, not as I do. Uh, but here I was uh, this, on Friday spending an entire day with this big pitch team, uh, and I was talking about the bingo card with them. Because I was curious as to what their perspective uh, on the answers were. And when we got to the question of uh, spending uh, vacation time, uh, they all looked at me and, and you know, they just said, well, we don't take vacation. So we had this entire conversation about it. We have, in fact, adopted unlimited vacation uh, in some of our agencies. And we're experimenting with that 
uh, from a global point of view. At first I heard about it, I said, oh my God, no one's going to show up for work if we have unlimited vacation. But it's actually so far worked out very nicely. But, but what was interesting was, here I was talking about how we have to be able to step back every now and then and smell the roses. And we ought to encourage people, certainly the leaders, to take some time off. Because frankly, this business is tough. And people are going 24-7, and as soon as they finish one, they're on to another. And it really it requires people to sit back and, and you know, take some free time. So the, the story was very interesting. I was talking about it in the morning. The whole day goes by, and now I'm on the red eye coming back to New York with a whole bunch of them. So we're all we're sitting around, and I said, well, you know, we started talking about vacation. And someone said, yeah, very nice of you to bring that up. Everybody on the team has put in for their vacation uh, <laughs> as a result of it, and now we have a staffing problem for the next pitch that we're going to. And I said, well, that's the whole point. You know, these people have just worked so hard. So I think we all have to do a little more uh, in terms of getting people uh, to, to step back and, and unplug a bit, because it is a grind, and, and frankly, it affects your judgment. So if you're, if you're in a very senior position, if you don't have that time, uh, I would question your ability to make clean decisions and, and appropriate ones. We're all going to go work for Michael Roth. <laughs> um, last word on micro action, then I'm going to do a quick wrap up. Sure. Um, looking at the list, the sponsorship micro action is an important one for what we, where we started and where we continue on our journey at 11. Um, but actually, just like you know, so many things start at home. It, the focus has, in, in the early years has not actually been on recruitment as the outbound strategy. It's actually recognizing the talent within the agency. Um, when we formed a management team as a decision to create space, um, the, the acknowledgement and, and somewhat you know, embarrassing discovery is that the agency was being run by very strong, very capable, very powerful women. They just weren't being acknowledged as having run the agency. And so the management team naturally was 50% um, women because we were just making it up of the people we are already relying on to run the place. Equally, the um, female leadership in the creative department that has risen up has all also risen from within because they're already here. Um, so that sets you on a, on a certain pathway. The, t the, the, uh, the one that I feel like we're more ready for now, um, it's a funny way of saying it, but it's the, the one, I think it was like the, the author, or the, it's where the, you know, forcing into our creative briefs and our creative reviews um, a challenge of stereotypical defaults. Really asking everyone to rethink, you know, the casting and the character that you're putting into the work that we then put out into the world. I, I think we do it sometimes. I think it's something that we could do all the time. Shelley, I have to let you comment on that before I wrap. Yeah, I think we all have to be chief troublemakers and disrupt the model a little bit because the world has changed and corporations have to evolve with that. Um, we have technology now that gives us more flexibility. And if we just retrofit where we've been to where we're going, I don't think we're going to get there. It is going to take the Michael Roths of the world saying we need to reimagine how we work today to make sure we get the best and not just those that are the available. Beautifully said. Um, I want to just share a handful of things that I heard that will make me go out and feel differently about how to act and how to ask the men in my professional world to act on this topic. Courtney said, recognizing the dissonance is a gut punch and it's time we all get punched if we haven't. Um, Michael told us, and I thought this was really telling, the person with the pencil and the eraser has to be very forceful on this issue. In other words, if it doesn't stop, start at the very top, it doesn't happen. And we need many more people at the very top recognizing that diversity inclu and inclusion are issues of competitive advantage. Um, Bruce pointed out, and I thought this was so important, that the qualities and the skills that make great creative leaders don't necessarily make for great managers or business leaders. So there's something there in pulling more women along. Um, Courtney said, and I'm going to go back and do this, you have to rip your organization open, and I think you just came back to this in your last point, to make more space for people, a diverse group of leaders to come through. And then Max said to us, you also have to force the issue at the ground up. And he came back later and said, what's missing right now is the middle. 
Shelley said, gender equality is not a female issue, it's an economic and societal issue, and it doesn't get solved without feminism. Bruce said, hire people for what they are capable of, not what they've done. I thought that might have been the biggest sort of underlying insight to come from this panel about how to think differently about bringing more women in. Um, Shelley said, don't try and fill the quota, make the business better. Courtney said, it's not about the list of things you need to say, and I'll remind you, he got this from his mom. It's about <laughs> having empathy for the context. Bruce said, and I love this, it's almost my end, action is all that counts. And on that note of action, Michael Roth talked about the bingo card in his meeting on Friday, and he wants us all to have unlimited vacation. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Shelly Bruce, Max, Michael, Courtney, big round of applause. Thank you all. Thank you.